I'm thrilled to be up here with Saji, who is um, CEO of Benchling. Um, I'm from Benchmark. Don't let the benches confuse you. That's uh, <laughs> just a coincidence. Um, and an investment thesis. Yeah, and an investment thesis. Invest in everything that starts with Bench. Um, but I, I'm, I've been lucky enough to, to work with Saji for the last seven-ish years. We were trying to figure it out. Six or seven years, um, something like that. And um, it's been, a, been an amazing experience as the company's grown from 30 people to 800 people and um, thought, we could, thought we could talk about that. So Benchling is the SaaS platform for biotech R&D. And one of the things that is so amazing to me about it is almost every part of the thesis is like kind of what not to do when starting a company. <laughs> um, you started with academics who have no money, um, and then you went into a limited market, or at least what's viewed as a limited market, a vertical market, um, and then you are selling a cloud solution to, at least at the time of founding in 2012, a bunch of customers who are extremely privacy sensitive, were late adopters to the cloud, very security conscious. Very security conscious. So is this a like multiple wrongs make a right kind of situation? <laughs> or how, you know, here we are today, you have 800 employees, gobs of revenue, 1,200 customers. Like, take us through it. How did you figure it out? Um, and, and maybe from 2012 to, to 2018. All right. I will condense 12 years into two minutes. Um, yeah, so I, I'm Saj, one of the co-founders of Benchling. Our, our mission is to unlock the, the power of biotechnology. Um, so we make, you know, think of Benchling as modern software for modern science, like nice and simple. It seems very, very reasonable. Um, when we started the company, so I, I came from the world of software. I'm a, I study computer science. I'm a software engineer by, by training, but I spent a bunch of time working in a, in a biology lab because I thought science was really interesting. And the thing that really struck me was that all these scientists doing very important work or doing it with like, you know, pen and paper in the lab, some spreadsheets, all the software that existed looked like it was from 1995. It was really, really stark contrast to the world of software where I came from where there was like GitHub and Jira and all these amazing tools that developers would, would build for themselves. And so the thesis was really simple. I wanted to build really great tools for science and science is pretty, pretty important, at least it seemed to me. And like, I didn't know anything about like how to think about the market and initial product market fit or, or things like that. So we really started with this very, very narrow approach of we're going to build software that's going to win the hearts and minds of scientists. And the only scientists I knew at the time were academics. They were people doing their undergrads, their PhDs, their postdocs at universities. And these people, again, were doing important work. But as, as Eric was pointing out, they had absolutely no money. And so a lot of people would kind of look at me funny when we would talk about what we were doing or they'd say, this is never going to go anywhere. You'll build a really nice, nice tool, but you'll never be able to, be able to monetize it. Um, and, and they were... They were actually like right to some extent. We, we don't make any money off that part of our business. That's not the business. Um, but what that did teach us was how to build uh, a product for an important end user. Like we started with the product before we got, got to the business. And so the first couple of years of the company were all about getting as many of these kind of academic scientists using Benchling. And I got some really good advice early on that it's better to make a product that a bunch of people, uh, sorry, make a product that a few people really love than something that a lot of people just, just kind of like. For the first year of Benchling, we had maybe like 20 or 30 active users, which I think most people, that's, that's crazy, right? I think, I think most people would, would give up, but for us, we knew that we were targeting an important set of people, and those people were spending all day in the software, so we knew we were onto something. And so anytime people kind of looked at it and said like, hey, your, your market's too small. Kind of what I heard was like, oh, we don't think you're, you're good enough to expand your market. And I think great, great founders and great companies, they expand their opportunity set over time. And so we went from academics to then small companies and then medium companies and then large companies and, and figured out how to build a business in, in the process. But we had built a team that was really, really good at building software that won the hearts and minds of the end, end users. And that's the thing that's kind of carried us to, to where we are. Would you, do you think that ignorance was bliss? Like, was it the fact that, like, if you think about it today, there's so much information out there about, you know, market sizing and product market fit and mm -hmm. hacking and everything else. And what I heard from you is like, you didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. I, I would say that the 
like if I were to, whenever I talk to, to founders today who are just getting getting started, the, the thing I stress to them that they have as an advantage is being totally naive and having like a beginner's mindset. I don't mean naive in a, in a bad way, but really having a beginner's mindset. The problem is like once you know a lot of things, like you can easily talk yourself out of everything. Like there's a hundred reasons why something is, is not gonna work, but I didn't know any of those. From my perspective, People doing scientific research, that seems pretty important. I know I'm pretty good at building software. Why don't I make tools for them? And like, if it's valuable, it'll probably go somewhere. And can you just talk about like the funding part of it, which is you're going after academics. It's unclear that academics are going to pay anything mm -hmm. for it. And at like, what point along the path did you say, hey, wait a minute, we have to go to biotech and pharma companies, um, and that's what the business is going to be? Yeah. It took a couple years. I would say this is an area where like we could have moved faster. I think as a as an engineer, I didn't want to sell stuff. Um, I wanted to like build this nice, beautiful product, and people would come and swipe their credit cards, and all all would be great. But uh, a lot of products, especially ones that are like more transformations, they have to be brought to the customer, and the customer has to be educated and so forth. And and so for us, like what ended up happening was some of these academics who really like benchling kind of finished finished school and like went, went to companies and brought benchling with them and we saw that as the opportunity to, to monetize but that this took a couple of years like again i think a lot of folks will, will work on an important idea or problem they'll build a lot but they won't actually spend just as much time building as they spend like marketing and selling i think people give up give up too easily so like it took us four years to really get go from initial idea to kind of commercial liftoff we had great milestones along the way, usage and things like that, but we weren't like generating revenue and scaling up for four or five years. And, and just talk maybe about the funding that you kind of took along the way and like yeah. what you were raising on. Yeah, we existed on a very, at least in today's terms of what people raise for seed rounds and things like that, we existed on like a shoestring budget for a very, very long time. The company was just a handful of folks for the first couple of years. I think at the time where Eric invested, we were maybe 20 people and we were already at that point starting to generate in the millions of dollars a year in, in, revenue. in revenue. Yeah, maybe you could probably share what you saw when, when sort of we met in, in 2017 and why, why you invested. Because the thing for us is early on, we realized that we weren't gonna get a lot of investment because we're a software company selling to biotech. And so everyone in software was like, hey, that seems really cool, but like we don't understand biology. And all the biology people were like, this seems really important, but we only invest in drugs. And so, you know, we, we were kind of between a rock and a hard place for a long time. Yeah, when I first, uh, when we first met, um, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about life sciences. I still barely know what the product does, <laughs> um, and I've been working with the company for a long time. So it's, it's, you know, but when you came in, you kind of talked about the business um, in a way that made me realize, like, wait a minute, this is a SaaS company. I kind of understand SaaS companies, so there's something for me to like work with um, on that. And I think, you know, one of the mistakes that I think entrepreneurs make all the time is they, they come in, you know, I see 200 to 250 new companies a year of which we'll invest in one. And so they come in and they talk about their boat. And what I mean by their boat is like their invention, their company. So they have a new navigation system or a new sail, or they have the best crew in the world, or they've designed something new, or it's a new material. And so they're, they're just like, this is the best boat. And I actually don't give a shit about the boat. And especially early on, like it just isn't what, what matters the most. What matters is the wind. And my logic is, if the wind is really blowing, even like a shitty boat will fly. And if there is no wind, then it doesn't matter if you have the best boat in the world, it's not gonna move. And so what is the wind? The wind is what's changing in the world that is going to allow this company that nobody cares about, and let's be clear, like nobody cares about the, the startups, like what is gonna allow this company that nobody cares about and propel it forward? And that's the wind. And so for your, what you're looking for is like, what is that wind? What's the thing that's changing in the world? And I remember distinctly when you came in and pitched, um, the very first thing that you talked about was the shift from chemistry or small molecule based drugs to large molecule or biology based drugs. And like that was a massive shift that was happening in the industry. And you know, with that shift, the implications of that shift are that you need a new system record. So that was the kind of like why now mm -hmm. and, and what was changing that kind of allowed it to be there. And, and so I think like that was the first step where I was like, oh wow, this is really interesting. 
I haven't seen anything about that shift. It turns out there was a lot of stuff about the shift, but I didn't, I didn't know it. Um, and, but it did create a new software opportunity, and you kind of had to be at the nexus of both what was happening in the world of biotech and, um, and SaaS and understand like, hey, there's a new system of record which is gonna hold all of the DNA sequences and RNA sequences and then the resulting proteins. And like, if you had that, then that would be like a very powerful piece of software that could both accelerate biotech R&D and also, um, and also um, be a valuable business in and of itself. And then, so that was our first meeting. And then the second meeting, which I also remember really distinctly, where I got to meet Asha, your co-founder, we sat down. Saji said something, you know, I look at all these SaaS companies and, and he was like, oh, we've never had a customer churn. And I was like, never had a customer churn. Like, I, I look at a lot of SaaS companies. It's easier when you don't have that many customers. Yeah, yeah, it's easier when you don't have it. Um, but I look at a lot of SaaS companies and, and like, you know, everybody has some churn. Like, everybody has a little bit of churn, like early customers for whatever reason. And that was a big thing. So I was like, well, let's go through all the customers. So I remember we met at your office and you pulled up this spreadsheet. They didn't have a CRM or, or pipe drive or whatever people use um, these days. And just a spreadsheet of every customer transaction. Maybe there were, I don't know, 50 transactions. Not even, probably like 20 or 30. 20 or 30 transactions. So there's like as many transactions. And we just went line by line through every customer transaction. And I was just like, just tell me about that customer and what they're doing. And, and what I noticed in that, which was so compelling, was, was there were, in fact, no churns, which is amazing. I think there was one contraction, which was then it went from like 688 to 500. And I remember it was like going back up or something. And then the, um, but the, the really amazing thing was both Saji and Ashri were talking about these customers and their accounts, and they knew what was happening and how the customers were using the product all the way through. And I was like, holy shit, if there are two of them like this, this is Nexus, you don't have churn. And not having churn is kind of a sign of a system of record kind of software, then like there could be something really valuable here. And so that, all of that kind of came together. Um, and, and obviously we hit it off, so then that was that. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the like really nice things about vertical software is that you can, uh, like as a, as a company, you can get extremely focused on a very like narrow set of customers to start and be an imp incredibly important product to that set of customers rather than kind of being just a little bit important to, to a lot of different different companies. And that's something that's just served us incredibly, incredibly well. If, if you were to go back to the beginning now, not that you would ever do that. Nope. I wouldn't wish that upon never, you. Never again. <laughs> but if you were to go back to the beginning, what, and, and this is a, a group of people that are towards the beginning of their journeys, like what would you, it, what would you do differently? What would you advise differently? What are things that you thought that matter that don't or that don't matter that do? Oh man, um, I, I think so that beginner's mindset, very hard to get back. Um, so I think like staying really open-minded and staying really curious is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, I think, I, I feel like especially, I don't know how many people are like just coming out of school or something like that, but I feel like people coming out of college all have the sort of the same sets of, sets of ideas. And I ended up doing something different because I was curious about a different industry where not a lot of folks who could build software were, were going and often going to, going to underserved markets with some skills from the software world is like a really, really powerful thing. Um, it does require a lot of like time and patience. Like you have to go learn a new industry and learn to be credible. Um, and so I think, I think like just being really open-minded and curious is probably the, the first thing I'd encourage. I think the second thing is like the faster, like I think naming something a startup actually adds a lot of like stakes to the equation. Like whenever I talk to founders now, I always encourage them to keep things as like a project, project, yeah. project for as long as they can. It just gives you more flexibility um, because at the end of the day like the most important thing is your time and um, it takes a really long time to build something great I've been I'll have been working on benchling for 12 years as of a couple couple weeks from now and so like I have you know 
occasionally something catches fire and people build something durable and enduring and it they know in the first couple of years but for the most part like i don't really see that done i feel like it takes at least a, at least a decade to to make a make a dent yeah and so like the the patience and the long term mindset which is hard when you're fighting for survival of your company or to get product market fit and you're wandering in the dark but i think that's that's just incredibly important and then third is like pick a big mission you could actually be excited about working on for that long like i see a lot of very contrived things where people like they want to work on a startup, which I totally appreciate, but like they haven't thought about, can I get up every day and deal with all of the shit involved in company building for 10 years for this thing? And like, I think you don't have to know if it's gonna be 10 years, but it should be a space you're at least excited enough to, to be in for, for that long. Um, yeah. So the, so one of the kind of wild things, you know, tech companies deal with disruptions all the time. There's obviously been a lot of biotech disruptions. And one thing's kind of unusual about Benchling is you have both of those sets of disruptions. And I kind of think about, you know, over the course of these 12 years, we've had CRISPR, uh, you know, kind of the popularity RNA. of gene editing, COVID, RNA, yeah. mRNA. Yeah. Um, so you've had all of these um, kind of biotech disruptions. And obviously, you, we, we've had the, the rise of the cloud and the rise of cloud data warehouses and everything else around that. We now obviously have the rise of AI, um, which is infiltrating and changing every part of biotech and drug development and, um, and, and getting things through the funnel. Like, how do you keep the company, like, how do you avoid getting disrupted, obviously, by someone else? Mm -hmm. um, but also, how do you keep the company on top of those changes as, as they're happening? Yeah, I think one thing we I, I really pride myself on is we built a company that's incredibly customer driven. You know, one of the beauties of like I, I worked in a biology lab. I, I can sit in front of a scientist and have a conversation and not get laughed out of the room, but I'm I'm not a scientist at, at the end of the day. And so my co founder and I knew enough to be dangerous, knew enough to be credible, but we also didn't know so much that we like thought we knew the answer. And so a lot of our Benchling's success has been focused on just like listening to the customer. And when you're constraining yourself to wor work with one vertical, everyone's kind of asking for the same thing. And so then it was a matter of like, can you execute it? And it was hard technical challenges, um, hard to build a generalizable product that all these different cost companies doing everything from like gene editing to meatless meats to RNA vaccines to make a product that would work for all of them. Um, but we did it through just listening to the customers very, very, very carefully rather than going in sort of with a preconceived notion of what, what the answer would be. And so I think that's how we've really adapted to all the changes over the last decade in, in biology, which is kind of the disruption our, our customers are facing. Um, AI is probably the first time where our customers don't have a clear articulation of what they want. I mean, they want more transformative products that are gonna save lives and things like that to, to market faster, better, cheaper. Same thing that they've always wanted. But it's the, it's the first time where like the, the ground is sort of on the technology side is moving underneath our feet and it's kind of up to us to, to lead with some vision. And so I think that's a place where like we as a company have to get okay taking some risks, which Sounds easy in theory, but as you get larger and larger, um, you know, it's, it's harder and harder to do kind of new things that may not work. And so it's a matter of like creating space for that. Sometimes you're changing your organization to set it up in such a way where a skunk works effort won't get kind of crushed by a, a bigger company, which has all these high stakes when you have all these customers and revenue and things like that. And so it's, it's trying to find ways to encourage like creative and open thinking in a, in a bigger organization. It's, a, it is, it's an interesting case where, for the most part, it sounds like you could follow your customers or mm -hmm. work with them, and now you're with AI, you probably have to lead them. Yep. I think that's a much, much more eloquent way to, to say what I was and, trying to say. May, maybe for cloud, too. You, you led them in cloud, I think, yeah. in a lot of ways. This is, this is going to sound ridiculous, but when we started in 2012, and again, you got to... Like there's so many industries out there that are underserved by technology. I think that creates an incredible opportunity to build transformative products and companies that are that are really valuable. But cloud wasn't wasn't a thing for the life sciences in 2012. We would we would lose customers because they would say, "You want us to put our R and D, like our IP, that's gonna you know result in billions of dollars of, of medicines and other things, like in some cloud software." run by 10 people in San Francisco at some startup that might go away. And like, you know, they'd be like, that's ridiculous. Like, why would, why would we do that? Um, and I think it was a thing where we had to show the data points and like they could draw the line, line eventually, but we lost a lot of deals in the early days be because of that. And then they came back around? And then they came back around because their businesses were moving so fast, the technology they were using wasn't keeping up. And so, you know, 
what other reason would some of the world's like, you know, these are household names, the you know, Modernas and Sanofis and things like that, like why else would they bet on a startup for, for technology if not like a, a pain that was so great? One thing that you led on, so in, in, the, in the financing that we led, that Benchmark led, um, whatever, in 2018 or 2017, we, the, the biggest customer at the time was Regeneron, which I had never heard of, but of course we all have now subsequently heard of Regeneron. Um, but when I, I, I remember the internal ROI document that Regeneron had for their Benchling purchase was allocating consulting or headcount budget yeah. to software versus software budget to software. Yeah. So it was there, you were getting Most, people that... 100%. There, there's, for us, like we always knew there was a lot of resources in the biotechnology industry, like biopharma companies, they have a lot of revenue and a lot of, a lot of cash. So most of our customers, because there was no good option of a nice, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't an ecosystem of a hundred different SaaS apps they could buy. So they were building a lot of the software in-house. And so for us, like we both built a developer platform to help enable them and help them kind of extend and embrace what, what we built. But we also had to go in and like, it was a pretty clear ROI calculation of, hey, like we're going to keep making this better and better and better. Like you could custom build this, you could maintain this, it distracts you, it's just not your core competency. And so that became like the sales pitch to a lot of these, these larger companies and the, you know, on our end, we had to figure out how to make sure we were generalizing enough so that multiple enterprises could, could use our product. It's interesting because I think today, in today's world with obviously all the AI stuff, which I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum today, um, but with all the AI stuff, I think there's a lot more companies that can go after that headcount budget mm -hmm. um, or the consulting dollar budget than, than it used to be. Yeah, I think that's even more applicable in sort of industries that have a lot of barriers to entry or require a lot of knowledge. They're probably doing a lot of stuff manually or building a lot on their own that could be you know, great opportunities for, for transformative technology. When, so, you know, I think another topic that everyone's interested in is building the initial cap table, like raising those initial, um, and that initial money, and maybe even talk about, you've, you've put a lot of work into choosing the right board members and venture capitalists along the way. Um, and, and have done that very thoughtfully, maybe more thoughtfully than most. Like, how have you done that? And what are your, what are your lessons learning on that? Yeah. Uh, besides the fact that obviously Ben yeah, is the best. Yeah, it's out great. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I would say like co both actually co-founders and your first kind of series A, B board members. I, I think those are, you know, as you get later stage and you add more, more investors, um, like the, like the size of investments and ownership changes and, the, and their involvement across multiple companies changes. I think those like first one or two board members and your co-founder are some of the most important people decisions that you can make, make for your company. Like I, I would approach them with the, the seriousness of like you're making a 10 year commitment, like you're kind of getting married. Um, and so a lot of people, like I encourage them to date before they get, get married. Um, I feel like in 2020, 2021, uh, a lot of folks were like picking board members or making investments in like these you know, 24, 48 hour periods because there was so much capital flooding around and so much interest in getting stuff done. But then you're stuck with the person for, for a really long time. And I think it's just important to make sure you have a very aligned philosophy. You, you get energy out of working together and things like that. So when like the process where we ended up with Eric leading the investment and, and benchmark for the Series B, like we got to know each other over a couple of months. And the thing I looked for was each meeting, did I feel like I was getting energy out of spending time with Eric and was I also learning something? You know, sometimes you go in and you, you pitch and they ask very generic questions like, oh, what's the TAM, what's your competition, things like that. Um, I think our first meeting we talked about pricing and packaging for like, and sales for a good 40 or 50 minutes of it. Um, and I walked away and I was like, oh wow, like I actually like learned something out of that. And then I was like, I'm excited to do the second meeting. And you know, I got confidence after a couple of meetings there. And so I think pretty simple decision making from there of like, you know, is this a person that Wednesday night at nine o'clock and something's going wrong and, and they call me and I'm just getting in bed. Like, do I want to pick up the phone or am I going to like <laughs> wait and schedule a catch up later? And so I think people, when they're picking their board members, picking co-founders, like should put a ton of just care and time and thought into those, those people, people decisions. Um, Cause those are the ones that actually kill your company as well. If you get them wrong. So. It's amazing. Um, the, the thought that you put into it hopefully translates all the way through. You've had a, a set of angel investors and everything that have been there um, for that. And maybe just as a closing thought, again, like how do you get how do you get value out of the angel investors and the other early people in your cap table? 
Yeah. Um, put them to work. Um, they're they're there to to work work for you. Um, I I probably call this guy three three times a week with things to to do for me. Um, I think it's a relationship where you have to you will get in you get out what you put into it, and so you have to share a lot rather than being a kind of like an adversarial arm's length. They're my board member kind of relationship. So treat them as an extension of of the management team. Tell them the bad news quickly. Ask for help and like put them to work. Investors are there for everything from to help you recruit, to help you think through big strategic decisions, to help you be a sounding board for you know senior leadership and whether that's working or not, which was a huge part of company building after product market fit. Um, so I, I, they're, they're there to work for you. Awesome. Thank you all very much.